It's a personal holiday tradition for me to come down with my worst cold of the year. Low stakes laptop work in front of the television is how I while away the hours when I'm sick. Photoshopping Christmas cards that would disappoint my mother. Bullying incels on Facebook groups. You know, the Lord's work. <laughs> I was about it when I noticed a subject line that atta attached to an email that came in from my cousin on my father's side, which read, Some sad news. There was no need to unpack what that meant, so I took a little break to go sit on the toilet and look at memes. <laughs> Summoning up some dissociation as a little treat for myself before confronting the finer details about how my father died. I have this horrible feeling no one told you, the email confirmed, but your dad passed away last week. I breathed in, waiting to make friends with any feelings I had about the fact, and was annoyed that the few I could identify were exclusively about the fact where he'd been dead a week already. <laughs> My cousin invited me to call her any time if I wanted to vent, ask questions, anything, and signed off with a link to the live stream of my dad's memorial, scheduled for the coming weekend. Welp, that's the end of that, I said to my cats. <laughs> and then we all went to bed. It didn't surprise me that my father's wife, Sandy, hadn't told me my dad had died. Something late in life had driven her balls deep into the evangelical church culture, dragging my father with her. I tracked down my father when I was 18, sent him a letter, and for whatever reason, she had decided to open it. And that's when, she, that's when we both found out that the other one existed. In the way of boomers and their non-truths, my father had told his wife that he had been married before, but that I had been a miscarriage. <laughs> now, this was a double cruelty, because there had been a miscarriage, late and terrible, that my mother delivered into my grandmother's hands. But then my mother and my father had me and Sandy decided not to leave him over discovering it 18 years after the fact, though I am sure concessions were extracted. I don't know what they were. Boomers don't like talking to kids, especially the ones they were told were dead. <laughs> but I am grateful for her including me in them. She agreed not to divorce him if he went to meet me, and I am convinced my father would have burned that letter and ran if he'd been allowed. Now that he was dead and I had been pointedly pushed out of speaking at his service, the hashtag gratitude I'd felt for her stopped trending. <laughs> speaking at his service had been a kind of closure I'd preemptively planned on, considering how little meaningful contact we'd had. A coming out party of sorts. Surprise! I am a son! It wasn't a surprise to me that either that Sandy was religious. I'd been to her house and I'd eaten her food, which probably benefited from her love of Jesus. <laughs> Let's be honest, no atheist has ever been accused of making the best potato salad at the state fair. I forgave Sandy partially. My father was a liar, and liars believe that they're an exciting enough protagonist that other people won't mind donating some of their own story just to be in their chorus. There would have been no joy either for either of us if I had gone to the funeral. The southern appearance of a grown bastard child would have been a loud stain on her cottons. And moralizers dine on moral failings like starving cats do their deceased owners her reputation would have suffered. <laughs> it's possible Sandy was worried I'd ask for money, but the concept was absurd to my situation. The one and only thing I have ever asked my father for was to see him eight years prior, when I was out of my mind with PTSD from a deployment I'd just returned from, hoping to get the truth out of him about what he'd done in the Navy during Vietnam. He told me a story early on about being shot down in a helicopter while taking photographs and having to kill a kid who'd come up on him with a gun. 
How could he be a father after, the ta after taking the life of someone else's son was the whole vibe. And I'd be a liar if I said it hadn't made me feel better. If not less disposable, at least more tragically so. I'm very comfortable being tragic, just not basic. We got drunk together fast at the PB Ale House and stayed drunk for hours before I finally pushed him to tell me more about his war, specifically how he had managed to come home from it. I wanted to ease him into it slowly. We had to pause climbing the stairs to the roof deck because his emphysema stole his wind. Even then, it was evident this would likely be our last chance together. But, bef but confronting him with that story again, he laughed with full lungs, and then leaned in. My father's favorite expression was, fuck him if they can't take a joke. And in a moment of bonding, he decided to let me in on his. He admitted it was all a lie, a story cribbed from other veterans that he'd known. Not only had he never deployed, he'd been kicked out of the Navy shortly after boot camp for consorting with homosexuals. I know. <laughs> My brain shut down. Whether it was just another lie, a pivot to diffuse the shame of lying about being in combat to a son who actually had and who he knew loved queers, <laughs> I don't have the mental real estate to confront. So I closed the door to wanting anything more from him ever again, r regretting having ever tried and never, ever again reopened it. The next morning over a brunch where we both sat witheringly hungover in Balboa Park, I found out about the newfound role the evangelical church played in his life. I promised Sandy I would let you know. I'm teaching Bible study, he began. I calculated how long it would take for our mimosas to arrive <laughs> and nodded in acknowledgement. He continued about how he saw church life as a good opportunity for him to challenge what people really believed and make some change happen from within. He didn't bother lying about trying to believe in any of it. He was trying to convince me and maybe himself about this, how this new calling wasn't just an outright betrayal to pacify his wife. The first and only advice the man had ever given me was, between a bottle of Jack Daniels and a camera, there's nothing a woman won't do. <laughs> Not a total lie. I had to, here's to bed. Uh. <laughs> During the poorest year of my life, living off paychecks I had to earn in a New York winter with a fractured spine and no insurance, he called me up to invite him to go learn underwater photography in Mexico that summer, and God, I clang to that. And then when the thaw finally arrived, he told me the plan was off. Not because a blizzard had blown the roof off their house like I assumed, but because he'd bought a Miata. <laughs> He paused after telling me, seemingly in expectation that I would just be super pumped for us both. <laughs> I couldn't fathom, though, how somebody who absolutely lives so completely for themselves, for the experience of blasting dire straits with the top down on their sports car, could sit through the worst music made by man every goddamn Sunday unless there was a bit of a hostage situation taking place. <laughs> My face must have betrayed me. Despite his overture just being an obvious prompt for me to meet him halfway, I couldn't be moved. He'd made his bed, and I was finally dead to it. Christians have just never been my bag, is all I could muster. It surprised me then when this wave of emotion overcame him suddenly, his eyes tearing and his voice breaking. I just... I just love her so much. He was scared. 
There would be no new women at his age and health, no more mythology to make, just a slow rollout of bad news from doctors, tempered by the time he could enjoy with Sandy's grandchildren, now his grandchildren, who he loved more than blood often guarantees. There was nothing he wouldn't do to keep them. If my father I and I are as alike as I am terrified we are, he was also probably experiencing the same bottomless well of grief I do when I'm hungover. His emotions were short-circuiting until he could get right with the bottle again that was just taking too fucking long and arriving for the price we were paying. <laughs> In the months and years after that meeting, I wanted to believe he was grieving a darker subtext, that this moment of despair came from knowing his wife's growing zeal meant we'd not be seeing each other again if I wasn't joining her flock. I never got the chance to ask him. After he flew back home, we never spoke again, and I have since disabused myself of that fantasy. My father's obituary stated proudly and falsely that he served with the U.S. Navy's reconnaissance attack wing one. There was no mention of my existence. I called my mom up just to get a copy of my birth certificate. I didn't tell her why. Mom's in her 70s now, and I don't like battering her with mortality, but she didn't ask. She did suck her teeth, though. <laughs> Four days later, she sent me a scanned copy where I was listed as having no father. So bureaucratically speaking, I'm an immaculate conception. <laughs> I was mad at him, said Mom. And again, I understood why. He had lied to her about having divorced his previous wife, which rendered her marriage invalid and me a bastard. One of the many reasons she divorced him without bothering to ever ask for child support. So I told her that her ex-husband, my father, had died. <sighs> she exhaled. I feel nothing. The Sunday of my father's service saw me sitting on my couch with my cats watching the live stream like it was a Super Bowl halftime show directed by David Lynch. <laughs> there was a thumb-shaped man who spoke about Jesus in a way that would have bored Jesus himself, <laughs> but very little about my father. And then came this moppy-headed teenager who had known my father through Bible study, and he was earnest and funny and totally blameless. He even cried. I remember the time I'd watched my father playing with his grandchildren and how he'd caught himself and had the thought to say to me, if this is hard for you to see, I'm sorry. The teenager that was clearly the better casting choice. So finally, a small army of children took the stage to perform a choreographed dance to a Christian children's song about how the fruit of the spirit was not an actual fruit. Maybe a surprise to some of you, but it's not a grape. <laughs> it's not a cherry. It's not a pear. Pomplemousse? No! <laughs> and by the time they finished, not one goddamn fruit had gone unmentioned, and two children had begun crying from stage fright. <laughs> and that was the end of my father's service. No one related to him spoke on his behalf. No reflection of his life was mentioned outside of his service to the church. And I hope for his sake, in his final moments, he felt like he'd won, been able to control his narrative, hit that reset button, and die as an esteemed family man. But I couldn't help but feel like he'd been erased, much like I had. There are some rituals older than religion. I mean, shit, even crows hold a funeral. And a person deserves to be known. David Eugene Maxwell Bateman was as complicated a story as I have ever read. And in the end, the only person who knew who he was, who had passed, was a son that almost nobody knew existed. But 
thankfully, it's a son who regularly performs true stories about his life in front of rooms of people. <laughs> so, fuck him if he can't take a joke. Give it up for Justin Hutnall.